Dear Grade 12, I am Mrs. V. Ramlal. Welcome to the Junior Taki Winter School for Grade 12s. There will be a series of videos which will be live streamed in the next few weeks on the Junior Taki online. Please use this material as revision and also look at all the Grade 12 content in Life Science on the Junior Taki online. In this video, I will be looking at the question 2 of the supplementary 2022 paper. Right, let's look at the question 2. Question 2.1. The diagram below shows part of the human brain. So let's get an overview of the question. So there's a diagram of the human brain. 2.1.1. They first want you to identify part A. Then 2.1.2. You must state two functions of part D. 2.1.3. You must name the hormone that is secreted by gland C that has an effect on the long bones and then on the mammary glands in the breast. 2.1.4. You must state one way in which the brain is protected. 2.1.5. You must describe the role of the hypothalamus in thermoregulation for four marks. 2.1.6. Part B is involved in the homeostatic control of carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. Part B. And it says state the location of the receptors. Now they want to know where are the receptors that are stimulated by an increase in carbon dioxide concentration in the blood for one mark. And B. Name the two effectors that part B sends impulses to for 30 marks. So this is an overview of question two. But before we even answer question two, let's do some revision of the work of content that you need for this question. Right. Here's my summary on the brain. Now, in beige, this part that's labeled here and that I'm showing with my pointer, that's the cerebrum. I teach the functions of the cerebrum as VHS controls voluntary actions. So the cerebrum controls voluntary actions. H, responsible for higher thought processes, always give an example, memory and reasoning. And S, is responsible for perception of senses, senses such as sight and sound. In yellow, that is the cerebellum. The cerebellum now, I teach the functions of the cerebellum as BIM, responsible for balance, and equilibrium and responsible for muscle tone. Now the major difference between the cerebrum is the cerebrum controls voluntary actions where the cerebellum coordinates voluntary actions. And don't just say voluntary actions or higher thought processes. You must say use the words in front controls voluntary actions responsible for responsible for. Right. Then in a maroon color, that's the hypothalamus here. And the hypothalamus, I teach the function as BB state. It's responsible for body temperature, responsible for blood pressure, responsible for sleep, responsible for appetite, responsible for thirst, responsible for emotions. Then the corpus callosum is in a lighter pinkish color here that I'm using, showing you with my laser, my pointer. That is the corpus callosum. Now, the brain is divided into two hemispheres, the left and the right hemisphere, and the corpus callosum links the two hemispheres together. Then, our very important part here in the bottom, the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata is responsible for breathing and heart rate. And then, how is the cerebrum different from the spinal cord? Just some extra information. We know the cerebrum has a gray matter on the outside, white matter on the inside, and the spinal cord has white matter on the outside and gray matter on the inside. Right. Now, let's look at the question for the role of the hypothalamus in thermoregulation. Uh, here is my note on what happens, how the hypothalamus plays a role in a hot day and a cold day, when you, the changes to bring about a normal body temperature. Now, they're not asking you what happens on a hot day and what happens on a cold day. They are asking you the role of the hypothalamus. Now, as you can see here, when it's hot or cold, it is the hypothalamus that is stimulated. It is the hypothalamus that will then send messages, or most importantly, a better word, impulses to the blood vessels in the skin to either dilate or constrict. It is the hypothalamus that will send messages to the sweat glands to become more activated or less activated. Right, now that we've revised, let us go over question two. Question two. 
The diagram below shows part of the human brain. After our summary, we should know the parts, we should know the functions. 2.1.1, identify part A. Part A, we already know, that is the cerebellum. 2.1.2, state two functions of part D. Part D, we already know, that is the cerebrum. What's the functions of the cerebrum? Think of your two best answers. You can say controls voluntary actions, responsible for higher thought processes, in brackets an example, memory or reason, and the third one, perception of sensation. Only give your two best answers. 213. Name the hormone secreted by the gland that has an effect on. The gland in green, that's below the hypothalamus we all know is the pituitary gland. Now, what gland does the hormone? Sorry, what hormone does the pituitary gland secrete that has an effect on long bones? When we know that should be growth hormone because that, what, that is what makes the long bones grow. Then, what hormone does the pituitary gland secrete on the mammary glands in the breast? We know the mammary glands will secrete milk. We know that process is called lactation. And we know the hormone is prolactin. 214. State one way, one way in which the brain is protected for one mark. Now we already should know that the brain and the spinal cord is surrounded by meninges, right? And then the brain is also protected by the cranium. 215. They're asking the role of the hypothalamus in thermoregulation. We've already discussed in our revision what does the hypothalamus do. So we know the hypothalamus receives impulses from the skin receptors. The skin receptors meaning the hot and the cold receptors. And then we'll send impulses to the blood vessels of the skin, which will affect the flow of blood and influence sweat secretion. So it's quite a general answer. It's not specifically talking about hot day or cold day. 216. We know part B after our revision we know is the medulla oblongata that is responsible for breathing and heart rate. Now, the medulla is also involved in the control of the carbon dioxide. Now, where is these receptors that are stimulated when there's a high amount of carbon dioxide in the blood? And there we should know in the carotid arteries, which are special arteries on the sides of your neck. Then, B, name two effectors that part B sends impulses to. Now, effectors are muscles or glands. Now, we know when your heart rate, when your carbon dioxide levels are high, messages are not going to glands, but they will go to muscles. Now, what are the two muscles that the medulla oblongata will send messages to? Yes, so we know when you're increasing your heart rate and your breathing rate. So breathing rate, the muscles will be your intercostal muscles and the diaphragm, which is also muscle, and the heart rate, heart muscles. Don't just say heart. You have to have the word muscles because the question here has effectors. Right. Let's go to question 2.2. Let's have an overview. Let's read at what the, you are required to answer in this question. The diagram below shows part of the male reproductive system. Right. So there's the male reproductive system. You have label A, B, and C. And there is a diagram. A label says cut and tied. 221. Identify part A. Okay. 222. They want one function of part B. 223. During a vasectomy, part A is cut and tied, as shown in the diagram. Semen will, semen will still be released during copulation. Now, the question is, explain the composition of semen after the vasectomy. Okay, 224. In some rare cases, males are born with parts located inside their body because it failed to descend into the scrotum. How this condition may affect fertility. So, with the testes being inside the male's body, how will it affect fertility? So you have to either say decrease, increase. You must answer this question. That's for three marks. Two to five, describe the process of spermatogenesis. That's quite easy and straightforward. You should know this straight from the exam guidelines. And then 2.3, describe how the developing embryo is protected and nourished in an ovoviviparous organism. That is seven marks. Right, let's go over the male reproductive system as revision for your question 2.2. Now, in pink, that's the testes. 
The testes produces testosterone and produces sperm. So the more testosterone a male produces, the more sperm he produces. Now the testes is outside the man's body because sperm can only be produced at two degrees lower than body temperature, meaning sperm can only be produced at 35 degrees. In Grenia, that is the epididymis. Please know how to spell this. The epididymis stores the sperm until mature. In yellow, this tube, that's the vast difference. That's the tube that will tra transport the sperm past the three secretions, uh, th past the three glands, sorry, past the three glands in the, in the male's body. Now, when a man has a vasectomy, the vast difference is cut and tied so that sperm cannot leave the man's body. And if there's no sperm in contact with the ovum, there can be no fertilization. And so that is a permanent form of sterilization or contraception. So, the sperm will travel past the first gland. That's the seminal vesicle. It produces a thick yellowish liquid rich in fructose. And the fructose is uh, monosaccharide. It gives the sperm energy to swim the long distance to get to the ovum. Then in black here, that's the prostate gland. The prostate gland produces a milky alkaline fluid. Immediately when you see here the word alkaline, this will neutralize the acid in the male's body or in the female's vagina. And then in purple, that's the cowper's gland or the bulb or urethral gland. And that gland secretes a mucus, which allows for the sperm to swim, provides liquid for the sperm to swim, and it lubricates the penis for copulation. And then as this vas deferens enters the penis, that tube now is called the urethra. And it's the same tube through which a man will urinate and release semen, but never at the same time. Now, what is semen? Semen is the sperm plus the secretions from the three glands. Now, if a man has a vasectomy, sperm will not be able to leave his body, but his secretion will still, or his um, liquid that he will release, will still have the secretions from the three glands. Okay. Right, let's also revise the amniotic egg. Now, an ovoviviparous organism is an organism where the egg is formed inside the female's body, hatches inside the female's body, and the female gives birth to live young. Now, we can see there's the yolk, has a lot of nutrients for development of the embryo. The air space has a lot of air, which is important for gases exchange, as you can see here. The allantoy protects the embryo by removing wastes. And then your amnion, which has your amniotic fluid, protects the embryo from mechanical injury, absorbing shock and desiccation, and also acts as a temperature regulator. And then you have your albumin, also has egg white, has also has nutrients for the developing embryo. And then the shell is the hard outer covering rich in calcium, which protects the embryo. Now that we've done revision, let's go and see if we can answer question 2.2. The diagram below shows part of the male reproductive system. 2.2.1, identify part A. Now we already know the tube leaving the epididymis, this tube through which sperm will travel, that is the vas deferens. 2.2.2, state one function of part B. Part B, you definitely, you should know, that's the epididymis. Make sure you know how to spell that they're asking the function of the epididymis stores the sperm until mature. 223. During a vasectomy, part A, which is the vas deferens, is cut and tied as shown in the diagram. Semen will still be released during copulation. Explain the composition of the semen after a vasectomy. So, the semen will have no sperm. It will still have the secretions from the three glands, the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and the corpus gland. That's because the vasectomy took place before the accessory glands. That is why the secretions from the theory glands will still be there. Okay, that's how you're explaining the composition. You're telling me what is in the semen and why. 224. In some rare cases, males are born with part C, which is a testes, located inside the body because it failed to descend into the scrotum. Explain how the testes inside the male's body may affect the fertility. So, we know inside the male's body that temperature is too high. 
so spermatogenesis won't take place. The sperm will be abnormal or there can be no sperm produced, which will lead to infertility. 225. Describe the process of spermatogenesis. This is taken straight out of the exam guidelines, so this you should know. So, under the influence of testosterone, the diploid cells of the seminiferous tubules undergo meiosis to form haploid sperm. And that's your marks for spermatogenesis. Right, question 2.3. How the developing embryo is protected and nourished in an ovoviviparous organism for seven marks. Now in blue, that is my answer for protection. And the last line, which is in black, is the answer for nourishment. So you have to discuss protection and nourishment. So here you say the amniotic egg develops inside the mother's body which will provide protection against predators. The allantoy protects the embryo by removing wastes from the embryo. The amnion contains amniotic fluid, which protects the embryo from mechanical injury by absorbing shock, protects the embryo from dehydration, acts as a temperature regulator. Then the chorion and the shell also protects the developing embryo. The egg yolk and the albumin, this is for nourishment now, are rich in nutrients for the development of the embryo. Right. So that was question 2.2. Let's look at question 2.4. Question 2.4 was a very, very good question. So, an investigation was conducted to determine the change in ADH levels in the blood and the volume of urine produced over a 24-hour period. The procedure was as follows. One healthy adult participated in the investigation. The intake of food and liquids of this person was controlled for the duration of the investigation. The ADH levels in the blood were measured at 1,503 o'clock, um, 0,300 or 3 o'clock in the morning for five days, and the average was cal calculated. The volume of urine was produced from 800 hours to 2,000 hours, or from 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at night. And this was measured for five days, and the average was collected, calculated. The volume of urine produced from 2,000 hours or 8 o'clock to 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the night to 8 o'clock in the morning was measured for five days and the average was calculated. The results are shown in the graph below. So there you have in the first graph, average ADH levels in the blood taken at 1,500 hours, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon and 3 o'clock in the morning. And graph B, the average urine volume at different time periods, graph B. So there's your time of day, there's your time period, there's your average ADH levels. Now, what do they want you to do? Two for one. You must calculate the difference between the average volume of urine produced in the two time periods, show all workings, right? Two for two, explain how ADH levels in the blood at 0300 hours or three o'clock in the morning affects the volume of urine produced between eight in the night and eight in the morning, four marks. 243. Explain one advantage of the high ADH levels at 3 o'clock in the morning. 242. Oh, sorry, 244. A patient whose renal tubules are impermeable to water underwent the same investigation. Why? Explain why the ADH levels are expected to remain high all the time. All right. So before we answer this question, let's revise some work that will help us answer this question. All right. Let's look at ADH. ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. It's produced by the hypothalamus and secreted by the pituitary gland. So ADH plays a role in controlling the amount of water. So let me explain my diagram. In red, this is the blood vessels. In orange, that's the renal tubules. So when there's a low amount of water in the blood, the pituitary gland will secrete more ADH in the renal tubules. Now, we already know from our grade 11 work that there's a lot of water in the renal tubules. More ADH in the renal tubules will cause the water, the renal tubules to become permeable to water, and this water will leave and go into the blood vessels, and will now increase the amount of water in the blood. However, this water was supposed to be lost in the urine. So now that the water is reabsorbed, the urine will be, have less water, and it will be concentrated. Let's look at another situation of ADH. When there's a high amount of water in the blood, a message is sent to the pituitary gland to secrete less ADH in the renal tubules. This will cause less water to leave the renal tubules 
and go into the blood and that will cause the urine to have more water so it'll be a larger volume and the urine will be diluted right i hope this summary helps you right let's go and answer the question at 2.4 right now they are determining the change in the adh levels in blood and volume over 24 hours now let's look at the graph so here you have the adh levels taken in from the in the blood at different times and then you're looking at the average amount of urine now two for one calculate the difference between the average volume of urine produced during the two time periods show all working so we're looking at average volume of urine and we're looking at this graph between the two time periods you just take 71,53 and they want the difference minus 34,72 so that's all you do you subtract them and your answer is 36,81 don't forget milliliters per hour your unit is important now 242 how the ADH levels in the blood at 1300 hours affects the volume of urine produced at this time at 8 in the night to 8 in the morning now can you see at this time there's a high amount of adh in the blood and you can know that this is early morning or you can say night right and this is going to cause the renal tubules to become more permeable to water and more water is going to be reabsorbed and this is going to cause less water to be lost in the urine or produced in the urine so let's look at our answer yes High levels of ADH at night increases the permeability of the renal tubules, which allows more water to be reabsorbed into the blood vessels and less water is lost in the urine at 8 o'clock. Yes, so that we're explaining the graph now. What's an advantage of this? If less water urine is produced and if more ADH is secreted and less urine is produced, that means at 3 o'clock in the morning, you don't need to urinate. You won't get thirsty and you can sleep comfortably without any disturbances. So let's look at what the memo wants. What's the advantage? Less urine is produced, the person will not be able to urinate often, and sleep will not be interrupted. Okay, that's a very nice question. 2.4, 2.4. A patient whose renal tubules are impermeable to water underwent the same investigation. Explain why the ADH levels are expected to remain high at all time. Now, their renal tubules are impermeable to water. So water will not be reabsorbed by the renal tubules, right? The volume of water in the blood is going to be low. So what is going to happen? The pituitary gland will be stimulated to release more ADH all the time to try and increase the absorption of water. Okay, so that's like a negative feedback mechanism. It's a protective mechanism. This is a very nice question. I'm not sure if many of you would have known about that there's high amount of ADH produced when you at night, so you don't urinate um, when you're sleeping. So that it prevents you from, allows you to sleep all the time. So this is a very, very nice question. And you have to use your knowledge to answer the questions. And there is some, this is a level four question. So practice, practice, open your mind to these types of questions. Right, the last question, 2.5. Read the extract below. Some plants contain chemical substances such as alkaloids and cyanogenic glycosides. Alkaloids are bitter tasting compounds while cyanogenic glycosides are toxic substances. Caffeine is an example of an alkaloid that occurs in plants like Coffea arabica Arabica, sorry, Arabica coffee. Camellia sinensis is tea and Theobroma cocoa is cocoa. Although harmless to humans, caffeine kills pathogenic fungi. Nicotine is another example of an alkaloid that is furnished in tobacco plants. Now, 2.5.1. They want you to name two alkaloids that are found in plants. And the two that you can see here is caffeine and nicotine. So it's just answering straight from the passage. When you get the passage, answer from the passage. 2.5.2. Explain two ways in which caffeine production acts as a defense mechanism. Now we can see it is bitter tasting. And why will it be bitter tasting? So that the herbivores won't want to eat the leaves that are bitter tasting. Okay. The next one is we know caffeine is also toxic. It's toxic. This toxic is, this toxin kills pathogenic fungi. 
So it's toxic to fungus. And that will prevent fungi from growing on the leaves and that will protect the plants from any fungal infection or disease. And then 253, name one other plant defense mechanism and that we know is a physical defense mechanism and the example is thorns. Don't write physical, don't write mechanism, um, mechanical. They want the name of the plant defense, so thorns is the correct answer. Okay, thank you for joining me and watching question two on this video on question two of the sub 2022 paper. Join me and watch the video on question three. I hope you learned a lot. Please practice these questions, watch the summary videos, practice them, get used to answering these types of questions, as I'm sure some of these types will come out in your prelim exam and your final exam. So thank you again.